I'd like to thank uh, all of you, and particularly Adam, for inviting me here. Um, what I've heard yesterday and, and this morning uh, seems that there's nothing new under the sun, uh, <clears throat> except for, we, I can say we've probably come full circle. Uh, I don't want to give up my age, but uh, when I first got into criminology in Canada, I was, got my education in the United States, grew up in Canada, and got my education in the States, and taught at the University of Pittsburgh before I returned to Canada to help create the research center at Simon Fraser University School of Criminology. At that time, the dominant model was the Juvenile Delinquents Act, and it was all about welfare. And then uh, I was asked by the government to undertake a nap, be a part of a team to do a national study. And <clears throat> lo and behold, we've been through different, three different national laws in Canada. And it seems to be that we're addressing the identical questions that you're dealing with today, and that's what I want to make a theme of my, uh, my, my um, presentation today, is that uh, we share a lot. And what I've tried to do with my initial research in Canada was to say what's going on in other parts of the world. And so I first uh, started trying to create models of juvenile justice because the laws around uh, the Western industrial world seemed to be had so much in common, yet there were considerable differences. So by the time we get to the 1970s and 1980s, when I looked at the laws in Canada and in the various US states, in Australia and uh, New Zealand as well, uh, my colleagues in those countries were talking about taking slightly different directions. And we start off with a welfare model, uh, obviously 1908 all the way up to the 1960s. And the focus there was on the needs of the youth, not on the offense, not on the offender characteristics, just on the needs of the youth. And then <clears throat> we come into the 70s saying that we have real problems with the, the lack of procedural safeguards with the welfare model. And all of a sudden, there are calls to move to the justice model, which is, if you see the far, uh, your far right there, you'll see that the focus there was on procedural safeguards. Even though when we did national in Canada, we found that there was enormous diversity in the Canadian provinces and territories. Even though we have a national law, each province has the right to implement the law accordingly. And what we saw were fundamental differences in cultural, culture. Naturally, for those of you who have some familiarity with Canada, Quebec goes its own way. In fact, literally, it tried to go its own way and create a, a separate country. And, and I was part of the national team, and one of my colleagues who I've published a lot with, Mark LeBlanc, I used to say to him, why aren't you afraid when the federal minister talks? And we, when we conduct our research, because naturally, as Juan said yesterday, the federal government had an agenda. And they wanted the research to fit that agenda. And I remember saying to Mark, gee, we better pay attention. Mark said, no, there's nothing they can do to us, because we'll separate. So Quebec went its own way and created the corporatist model up there. And the corporatist model is based on a lot of the points that Judge Beecroft was making yesterday about diverting youth away, but not diverting them away to nothing, diverting them away to resources, to programs. So the corporatist model relies on only the most serious violent young offenders, those who also don't admit to some responsibility for their behavior, their actions. So the whole notion is a diagnostic team at intake. So the police, when they take a youth, they take them to a youth bureau, which was located in a social service center. And the idea is to come up with full outright diversion if it's a minor offense or minor offending, and then diversion to a program depending on the seriousness of the offense. On the other hand, by the time the new Young Offenders Act came in in 1982, the world had changed. We had gone in Canada and the United States, particularly based on the United States, towards a crime control model. So it started off as an attempt to protect kids' rights, ends up with a very powerful crime control perspective. The interesting thing in Canada that I assume you don't have in Australia, Canada, uh, m m most Canadians watch American television. Most Americans don't know Canada exists other than as a cold front. Uh, and what happens is Canadians think 
what's going on in the United States in terms of crime is occurring, uh, is occurring in Canada. No matter how much data I present to show that we only have 70 youth murderers. Well, because those uh, gangster rap and gangs are so popular in the States, most Canadians, as they see a kid with a bandana, think that the Bloods and Crips have come to Vancouver. So it's this sense of moral panic that came. And again, if you look at the, the crime rate, it did go up, but it went up relatively minor. And the actual number of kids committing homicide or first degree murder, attempt murder, really didn't change. It stayed around 50 to 70. That's in a country of 33 million people. Yet there was a moral panic. So the crime control model became very, very important in the Young Offenders Act. But uh, uh, each province took the Young Offenders Act and the subsequent act and started to implement these models. Now, I want to say that in Canada, uh, since I was part of the national research team with uh, colleagues like David Farrington from Cambridge University, uh, we tried to develop these models based on looking at Australia and looking at Scandinavia particularly and other countries. And this is what we found when I go to Europe and when I'm in Scandinavia, the welfare approach still holds. So the welfare model is very powerful there. The focus is on the family and the needs of the kids. Uh, that second one, the corporatist, is the flag of Quebec and possibly an independent Quebec. I don't see it happening, but I always tell my French colleagues that I respect that and I put that flag up. And they say, raise one of us. Uh, the modified approach is what I call occurs, I think, in Australia, in Canada, a bit of everything. Uh, and it varies by state as it does by province. The justice approach you see in England more. There they use the magistrates quite heavily, extensively. And when I say the United States, I'm, I'm simplifying. The United States is, a, as you know, 315 million people. Uh, when you're in Massachusetts or Minnesota, you think you're in a Canadian province. When you're in Texas, you think you're back in the 1840s. So <laughs> you can see that the, the models differ dramatically. And, and they do in Canada, too. Uh, I would say the welfare approach doesn't exist anywhere anymore because of procedural safeguards. But nonetheless, Quebec is out on its own there. Uh, and the justice approach you see occurring uh, in Alberta, even though it looks like Texas, acts like Texas. Fortunately, youth justice is, is, is uh, dominated by procedural safeguards. More crime control oriented are our prairie provinces in certain parts of Ontario. And I'm gonna get into that theme today, why? Why did you see more crime control? And it's quite controversial. And just the sort of uh, foreshadowing, it's because of the emergence of serious adult gangs, criminal organizations, who recruit you. So it's an important distinction that Canadians seem to forget. We really don't have pure youth gangs in Canada. We did for a brief period in the 90s, but they disappeared, as they did in every other period. I remember in the 50s growing up in a small industrial town, a working class immigrant Italian family that I came from, and all my Anglophone friends were afraid of me because they thought I was a, a budding mafioso hockey player. So all my friends from Trail who see me now as a professor studying violence think it's hysterical, of all people. <laughs> but nonetheless, I remember the 50s and 60s, you didn't come into the Italian areas for the fear of Italian gangs. Well, no, if you came in to eat the pasta, you were a friend. But nonetheless, this is the imagery that uh, I want to get at. Now, in the 1980s, what I argued, along with several of my colleagues, is whenever you put a mixed model of youth justice together in a law, you confuse the practitioners. So if you say that a law is there designed to protect the kids, help the kids, and hold them accountable, and not use custody other than the last resort, you find that people in the field, including judges that we interviewed, within the same courthouse, you had different sentencing patterns. Forget differences between urban and rural, which were enormous. When I'd go to a rural area under the YOA, the judges would say, I do what I want. These kids need to be held accountable. In urban areas, they had every procedural safeguard in the world. So 
not only was it variations within courts, but within provinces and among provinces. So what I predicted and other colleagues predicted was, as a result, the default would be to crime control. And that's what exactly happened. We had a substantial increase in kids going to custody for different reasons, some for crime control and some to protect the kids. So we saw a dramatic increase in the use of custody under the YOA and an increase in serious and violent offendings. So I argue that the law was too confusing. And sure enough, in the 1990s, as a result of some spectacular murders, moral panic ensued. And we, for the first time in Canadian history, we had a political party that wanted a crime control reform of the Young Offenders Act. First time it became a national political issue. Our Liberal Party, which is more like your Labour Party, uh, is always in the middle of the road, try a bit of this, try a bit of that. And they came up with the Youth Criminal Justice Act. Now, the Youth Criminal Justice Act, therefore, is designed to address the flaws and problems of the YOA. And one of the problems was that its sentencing philosophy was too simplistic. So sure enough, in 2002, and this law was drafted by was a, several of my colleagues helped draft this law, including Professor Nick Bella and Professor of, of Queen, Dean of Queen's Law School and uh, Tony Dube at the University of Toronto. And sure enough, they put every criminological theory into this law. So it's loaded with everything from what Juan talked about yesterday to uh, crime control to everything. As a result, it's one of the biggest laws I've ever seen. It's enormous and technical and complex beyond belief. As you can see, if you look at the preamble, it's designed to uh, ensure accountability and meaningful consequences. That's crime control. Minimize the over-reliance on, on incarceration. That's a, a corporatist diversion. Recognize the unique kids uh, and, uh, and requirements of particularly Aboriginal youth. Well, there we're back to a welfare approach. So uh, the, well, the YCGA introduced what I call, and this, these are my words, uh, not appreciated often in Ottawa, but trying to make sense of a complex law, I call them a four-stream law, four law. And this goes to much of what was discussed yesterday, particularly uh, by Judge Brikoff. Stream one is divergence, and it relies heavily on police. So we had extensive training programs in my province of British Columbia to deal with providing a variety of, of, of verbal warnings, written warn, warning, formal warning, warnings, and use of diversionary programs. And those are called extra legal measures in the law, the sections of the law. Stream two is extrajudicial sanctions, and that goes more heavily to the prosecutors and even judges at sentencing. They are able to use, that's where you get the more formal restorative justice type programs, sentencing circles, uh, and community service programs. Stream three is custodial sentencing for the more moderate, serious, and extensive property, serious property offending patterns. In there, the sentences, the use of custody is limited uh, to youth linked sentences. So there you're looking at maximums of five years and seven years for the serious violent offenses. And then it's stream four that has become the most controversial. And that is what called presumptive offenses. There the prosecutor, those are murder, attempt murder, sexual assault, armed robbery, in patterns of major patterns of moderate offending. So those are called presumptive offenses. There the Crown Council can argue for adult linked sentences because we don't have transfer anymore in Canada. There's no transfer hearings. And the law applies for youth between 12 and 18. So if you commit murder, if you're 11, 12 and, 11 and, uh, years old and under, there is no charge of any kind. So that's enormously controversial. So crime control advocates argue we need to go down to age 10. On the other end, if Quebec had its way, we would have went up to age 24 for it. So because the, not, the notion of youth that uh, Judge Brikoff mentioned yesterday, often you see in Europe, when you look at the notion of well, who's young, you have to go up to ages 24, 25 if we're going to be technical about it, which I believe we should be, but that's for another day. It'll never happen in Canada. So. The empirical research question that I'd like to try to address today uh, 
is, did the YOA reduce the use of custodial sentences because it was so high under the YOA? Uh, did it reduce the number of incarcerated Aboriginal young offenders, as you're going to see today? We have the identical problem that you have, the challenge, maybe I should call it more, more accurately, but we have it on a scale much larger than you do. Um, third, there's enormous provincial variations in Canada. And in 1982, uh, Premier Elliot Trudeau brought back our law from Britain because we were still technically under the British in 1982, and we created our own constitution. And in there, the Bill of Rights said that Canadian youth had to be treated equally anywhere in Canada. And we knew under the YOA and the JDA, it, uh, it was vast differences. You wanted to be charged in Quebec and not in Ontario or Saskatchewan. Quebec, for offenses that would get you custody in Manitoba, you'd be diverted out. So huge differences. Uh, we wanted to see if it reduced. Then second, we wanted to see, most importantly, whether we were incarcerating the most serious violent young offenders. That's what Canadians were focused on. That's what they wanted the law to do. In addition, I wanted to see, for my own purposes, for theoretical reasons, and also for, to be able to deal with the media, which I deal with almost on a weekly basis in Canada, are reductions in incarceration, incarceration associated with actual reductions in serious violent offending. And uh, second, are Canadian trans evident in Australia? Can they be explained by differences in new justice models? On the latter point, I have to admit that we're extremely tentative. We just started this study, and I'm working with Adam on this. And, and uh, so my findings are at best preliminary and tentative. I don't want to insult anyone by miscategorizing your states and territories. So bear with me on that one. The methodology, three sources of data, Statistics Canada, and then the AIC's detention monitoring program. So we go up to 2006. Adam sent me this material. And then this, the last one is my own study. When I say my own, it obviously involves a big research team. Oops. The study, as you see, it involves 1,100 serious and violent incarcerated offenders in our youth custody centers in British Columbia. All of them have been convicted of serious violent offenses or multiple serious offenses. I started in 1998 and we're still, the data goes up to 2011 and we're still coding. We're now following the 1998 cohort into their 30s. So we're trying to see where they went. And that data is being coded right now. And hopefully when I come back in the future, I'll be able to present that data uh, in all its complexity. Um, we, have a, we have almost a population sample, as you'll see. 95% of the youth in custody agreed to participate. So a lot of our statistics, we don't have to worry about significance, even though we calculate them, because we have virtually a, uh, a population sample. We use a combination of self-report and file information. Uh, this is particularly important because another area of my research is I've tried to focus on the theme of the handful of incredibly violent youth. There's a tiny percentage that we want to see if there are serious personality disorders that distinguish them, particularly the whole notion of are these incredibly vicious kids, are their psychopathic patterns evident? So we wanted extensive self-report as well. The interviews take upwards of two and a half hours. So we have a massive data sets. Uh, obviously, the classic demographic characteristics. We have offense history. And then we have the offender-oriented characteristics and family circumstances, uh, school involvement, substance use, abuse, and self-identity. And this is particularly important. Uh, uh, as uh, Juan pointed out, uh, we want to look at self-identity, what the kids think of themselves. Very, very important, particularly when you're looking at treatment modalities or treatment intervention strategies. And then the other thing we wanted to do, based on our cohort studies in Canada and elsewhere, family characteristics. Um, in other words, what we see more and more intergenerational transmission of, uh, of protective factors and risk factors. So what we find with our studies, the kids are mirroring their family risk and protective profiles. And that's very, very important when it comes to intervent treatment intervention strategies. <clears throat>
Well, we have to break it down by region. As you know, Canada is a massive geographic entity, and it varies dramatically uh, by, uh, by, by province. Uh, when you look at the Canadian rate, it's the black one. The incarceration rates per 10,000, you can see they hover around somewhere between 15 and 20 for the national and 15 to 25. So the prairie province, uh, the, the Atlantic provinces hover around the, the national rate. And there's some outstanding issues with informal gangs in the, in the province of Nova Scotia because in Canadian history, there was an influx of, of uh, uh, American slaves. And so we have in cities like Halifax, a substantial number of African Canadian youth. And again, disproportionate involvement for a variety of reasons we'll get into. Now here is where the major challenge comes in Canada. You can see there that those two prairie provinces of Saskatchewan and Manitoba have substantially higher rates of incarceration than the other provinces. And they are substantially higher. And their provincial youth justice systems have shifted towards the crime control model. And the reasons that, I'll, that again, I'll, I'll get to you more detail later, but the, in the 1990s, we saw, for the first time in Canadian history, the creation of American adult youth gangs. And interestingly, uh, again, I don't want to get too far into this, but because uh, uh, I'll save it for later, but basically what the Canadian government did, because these were federal crimes, they said the, they didn't want to repeat the American pattern where the adult gangs recreated themselves in the federal and the state systems. So what they did was they spread the youth gang leaders into Saskatchewan and Alberta, and the unintended consequences was they created gangs there. So it's, it's, it's actually a fiasco. <laughs> Good intentions, but the fact was they spread gangs throughout the rest of the Prairie Provinces. Now, when you look at Ontario, it's our biggest province by far, so naturally, its rate is going to be reflected in the national rate. So Ontario pretty much goes for the national rate. On the other hand, by far and away, the lowest are down there with my province and Quebec. As you can see, we're down. We ended up closing, of our six custodial institutions, we closed three. And I was part of the advisory team to the provincial government beginning in the 1980s all the way up till today, and it was a conscious policy. So here's where, when uh, Judge Brikoff talks about hope, uh, there, was a, there is hope, and it's pretty powerful that these two provinces have set up a, a system of explicit policy to reduce the types of kids that get into custody. And I'm going to show you, discuss a paradox. Well, we succeeded like, admirably in reducing where we did fail is in the treatment area, and I'll get to that later again. In northern Canada, our territories, uh, Nunavut, Yukon, and Northwest Territories, as you know, like in your, North, uh, your uh, northern territory, it's overwhelmingly First Nations and Aboriginal communities. They started off extremely high, I would argue catastrophically high, and as you can see, they've plummeted too. So again, you talk about hope, you talk about a successful policy, I believe it's worked. And I think it addresses some of the issues that Juan talked about. That's they've developed for the first time in history, particularly the Nunavut, they have now control of their own territory. And that's happening as well in Northwest Territories. They have more and more control in say over their own youth justice system, their own education system, their welfare system. And I think very, very importantly, over their economic structures. Because I think that's one of the keys in the Canadian system, unlike the US system, uh, by and large, the Supreme Court of Canada, I'm getting a bit of horse here, I can get some more. The Supreme Court of Canada has argued that the treaties that the First Nations and Aboriginal communities signed with the British colonial governments are still in effect today. So that's a very, very important difference between the US and Canada. Now, this is very critical because the Youth Criminal Justice Act and the Supreme Court of Canada 
has argued in a various series of case law, and in particular it's called the Gladue decision, stated that for all Aboriginal youth and even adults, Aboriginal status is a mitigating circumstances circumstance as to seriousness of, the, uh, of custody, of sentencing. So you have to take into consideration Aboriginal status and reduce the number of the length of the sentences. And if you look there, it's actually had a dramatic effect. A year after the YCJA, the Youth Criminal Justice Act was enacted, a 21% drop in youth, Aboriginal youth going to custody and a reduction from the peak, as you see, 2001-2002, 34%. So it's quite dramatic. And you see it quite even, in, very encouragingly, in, in, the, in northern Canada, over half reduction. Here's where, as I said to you before, here's where the problem is. Well, they've gone down 31% a year after, it's only come down 25% from the peak in the prairie provinces. So the crime control approach to Aboriginal youth in the, those, the Manitoba and Saskatchewan remains in effect and as we're gonna see with pretty catastrophic consequences. If you look at Ontario, a quite dramatic reduction. In Quebec and BC, those are somewhat misleading. If you look at the actual numbers there in BC, we went from 2,400 to 1850 uh, uh, a year after, and 30, now 3,100 down to 1631, which is why we closed those three custodial institutions in British Columbia. So again, I think we show in BC that there are ways of dealing with youth outside of a custodial approach. In Atlantic Canada, uh, a, a significant drop in Aboriginal youth there. Now what I want to get at is the Youth Criminal Justice Act says that the only youth that should, up in, should end up in custody are ones that have the most serious offense profile. But what I wanted to see is whether the youth ended up in custody had the most serious uh, offender characteristic profiles. In other words, the difference between 1980 and 2002 was, I would argue, was we have a better understanding based on cohort studies, particularly the famous Dunedin study that was done by Terry Moffat and, and Caspi et al. It's a landmark study. We have a similar study in Canada by, uh, 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 by uh, Richard Tremblay, where it, it goes to, uh, again, to Juan's point that it's not rocket science that the type of kids that end up in conflict with the law come from incredibly difficult backgrounds. And the treatment modalities that we used throughout the 80s and 90s weren't dealing with those profiles. So I wanted to see if, in fact, the type of youth that ended up in our custodial sentences had different profiles. When you look over there, I think very, very important because of the our, uh, one of the, when we looked at our, our study in detail, what I think is underdiagnosed, just about in every jurisdiction I know of, um, possibly the exception of Scandinavian uh, countries, is punishment by parent involving trauma. Or I think we misdiagnose that or underdiagnose it dramatically, particularly from years zero to six. I think we have very little ability to get at that, and because I have another major study with a colleague, Patrick Lussier, and that I'll try to present some preliminary data for. Again, I wish I had the time to present that data because we have a clinical sample there, plus we have a high-risk community sample, a normal community sample, and the trauma zero. I should, in fact, I should say trauma from pregnancy, perinatal, to zero to, to six is enormous, and that's being left untreated. That's why I put that. 92% up there. Left home, again, you can see how dramatic it is. Kicked out of home, 60%. Child in care at the time, that doesn't reflect the number of th that the kids have been in care. In fact, up to half have been in care. But at the time they end up in custody, a quarter. In fact, it's one of our best predictors. So here's the ultimate paradox. 
The more the government intervenes in the family structure and tries to take the kids out of it, the worse it is. The greater the likelihood they're going to end up in youth custody and adult custody. So when we try to answer that question, we've not come up with answers. We don't know why. I'll give you some hypotheses later. School involvement, you could see less than half were attending school. If you see at the age of the school became a trouble, and when I say problems here, I'm not talking about occasional reprimand. I'm talking about getting kicked out. You can see there it started at age, around age eight to nine. So this is incredibly challenging. Substance use and abuse, and I'm talking about extensive use. So when we look at alcohol, it's virtually 100%. And when we ask the kids, we're not talking about occasional, we're talking about daily drinking within our custodial sample. And then we talk about composite substance abuse, we're talking about heart drugs here. We're talking about crack cocaine and heroin. So when we look at those two figures, the argument we make there with our, again, because I can't present the full data, it's, I would argue that overwhelming the kids are talking about self-medicating. So instead of saying that they're abusing the drugs for the sake of high-risk behaviors, I would argue that they're abusing the drugs or using the drugs to self-medicate. And then we look at mental illness, and we're talking about serious mental illness here, we're looking up to a third. The offense history, the YCGA, they're coming in later, and they're coming in later because they've had a longer time to commit more serious offenses. School involvement hasn't changed. Abuse and self-identity hasn't changed. In family member history with family abuse, that really hasn't changed either. Now, I'll present these statistics. I won't get into what they all mean. Uh, the most important aspect of this is if you look over at Model 3, and you look at that first figure, 0 0.6, 0 0.17, 2.3, those are our odds ratios. That's the key. And those are significant, because what it says, in effect, that uh, the earlier you start committing crimes, the greater the likelihood that you're going to end up in custody, and your aboriginal status also is highly predictive. But most importantly, the violent offense is very most critical. So the law was designed to do that, and it succeeded. We're no longer putting kids in custody to protect them or to try and treat them in custody. And that was one of the big challenges on the Young Offender Act. As, as, uh, as Judge Brekoff said, the dilemma that a lot of frontline workers face is you're trying to help the kids, you're trying to protect the kids. The only safe place to try and do something like diagnose, it, diagnose the problem profile, do something about it, is in custody. Because our community programs are just woefully underfunded and the kids won't stay. They run. So they breach and they come back in on a breach. So here's our, our challenge in our system. So when we look over there, we can see the, uh, the importance of, of that. Now, the other question was, okay, we've succeeded, I would argue, in varying degrees interprovincially uh, to uh, incarcerate far fewer youth, which is, again, what the law set out to do. But the second question I get in the media over and over again is, did it affect the actual rates of violence? I think that's the point you were trying to make, too, yesterday, Juan. And, and, and I think, Judge Brekoff, it, a lot of it depends on the type of violent profile that you're looking at in New Zealand versus our Canadian problems. Big difference. Um, what you're going to see here is it didn't affect it. So here we have this elaborate law. We have gone a long way to introduce all the criminological theories into this law. But when you look at the rate of violence, it's actually stayed steady or increased somewhat. These are serious, serious violence. So the charge rates, which I argue are by far and away the more valid measure rather than conviction rates, there's all sorts of reasons why conviction rates vary. So the question is, why hasn't the rate dropped? Why haven't crime control models worked? Why haven't uh, 
the uh, uh, corporatist models worked and all these different models work. Well, let's go look at Australia here at Adam's data. Uh, the non-indigenous youth, that, 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 those patterns follow the Canadian patterns, far fewer. And the variations there, uh, as Adam explained to me, uh, uh, are, are, are quite dramatic, but they're often, they reflect the base rates. And we'll get at that in a second. When you look at the ACT, the ends are 16. You're gonna get dramatic swings. If you drop by 11, it looks fantastic. Or if you go from uh, an N of four to uh, a rate of an N of four to an N 11 on your, on your rate, that too looks dramatic. So you have to look at, really look at absolute numbers. And again, wild swings there depending on rates. If you look at New South Wales, you see that the ends are again very, very low. So from a Canadian perspective and US perspective, you're doing a lot right here. Despite what the media presents, it looks like you've gone uh, considerable lengths to keep your numbers down. Because compared to Canada, we still incarcerate an awful lot of Aboriginal youth compared to, to Australia. I actually thought they'd be far, far higher, so I was quite surprised. However, when you look at your ratio, here's where you reflect the Canadian experience. You're 19 times higher, so you've succeeded and, and you've not succeeded. I guess that's the whole point of why we're here trying to understand this phenomenon. So to return to the Canadian context, the, I would argue that we've been successful in reducing uh, the Canadian rate, particularly the variability among provinces, the absolute rate, the variability among provinces dropped dramatically. Where we've not succeeded at all is down on point two, uh, point three, I'm sorry, is the exceptions to the trend are Manitoba and Saskatchewan. <clears throat> they actually exhibited increases, and the increase is associated with serious violent offending, homicide, attempt, murder, serious assault. And the overwhelming theoretical consensus among criminologists in Canada is it's linked to the emergence of serious adult Aboriginal criminal organizations. And these are criminal organizations based on US, US gangs. They're heavily involved with drug trafficking and they follow the American pattern, the classic American pattern. What's going on in Canada is we have a dramatic internal migration. Uh, our cities, our metropolitan areas are exploding. And for example, in Vancouver, when I first started doing my research in the 1970s, I worked with the Stolo Nation and the Naklapamau and when I first started going there, they were considered rural. When we go back now, Van Greater Vancouver is spread out to bring them into a metropolitan network, which means a youth can get from uh, what would take an hour and a half, they can get into downtown Vancouver in a half an hour. So there's no such thing as e rural reserves for a lot of our First Nations. They're able to get into metropolitan areas overnight, I mean very quickly. So we have with uh, uh, our, uh, Paul Maxim, White, and Dan Bevan to show a dramatic change in internal First Nations Aboriginal uh, mobility patterns. And that happened in our big cities in the prairies. So Winnipeg, for example, in North Winnipeg, it starts to resemble South Central LA and Watts. It is an enclave of what Sean McKay called low income, poor housing, high unemployment rates, poor schools, and the emergence of adult gangs. I'm heavily involved with drug trafficking, and they are linked to the major traditional organized crime gangs in Canada. And that's the Italian Mafia, unfortunately from my home area of Calabria, 
and Sicily and Naples, and they are linked now to the other major Canadian gang, the Hells Angels. So the Aboriginal gangs are heavily involved with drug distribution into the uh, native Aboriginal First Nations communities. So they're involved with drug distribution. And that's true in Northern Ontario, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, and now BC. And the more effective the policies, the policing policies are in the cities, the more quickly did these Aboriginal adult gangs spread into the small towns and now they're into the reserves. So you see unintended consequences, the, the policing result in the, the emergence and recruitment of Aboriginal youth on the rural reserves in the small towns, let alone the cities. So it's a drug distribution network that's causing these high crime rates. I'll get back to that in a second. The, uh, just to reiterate, uh, the YCJ was very successful in targeting the most serious offenders. Higher risk profiles. But again, the question is, why didn't it reduce the violence rate? And here's where I guess there's a lot of controversy of which I'm in the middle of. Uh, in the late 90s, um, I was part of a research team involving 14 countries, United States, Canada, all your Western European countries, plus your new Eastern European countries were coming in the European Union. And we call it Krakow because the, we, did one, uh, we did it in Vancouver and in Poland in Krakow. And we created the Comprehensive Risk Assessment Management Instrument, trying to reflect where was criminological and, psycho and psych psychological theory going to, and we call it developmental criminology. Again, based on the cohort studies coming out of Dunedin, New Zealand, and out of Canada and the United States and Scandinavia. And we developed um, what we call a multiple pathway models based on this Krakow instrument. And the Krakow instrument is designed to identify, using some of the latest uh, uh, breakthroughs in genetic research, but even more important than genetic research, is the effect of environment on genetic expressions. And that we found the most critical period was in utero. So our Krakow instrument is designed to assess the pattern of risk and protective factors during pregnancy. Because what we found with our youth, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, because if you look at the risk factors, there are no differences. The same risk profile for Aboriginal as non-Aboriginal, where there are differences in prevalence. And those differences in prevalence are linked, we've gone full all the way back, it's linked with poverty and disrupted family. So when you talk about the effect of colonialization, what you're looking at is colonialization not only destroying First Nations cultures, but equally important, I would argue, it's the destruction of opportunity to participate in the economic life of now, what we call advanced industrial Canada. You cannot get a job in Canada without type, some type of formal training. You will not get it in any, that's just where Canada is today, like Australia. So the idea was to say the issue for serious and violent offending is a health problem. Yet when we try to go to the governments and say it's a health problem, they turn around and say, well, that's not our jurisdiction. That's Canadian federal government's jurisdiction because they deal with reserves. And we come back and say, but most Aboriginal First Nations people live in cities off of reserves. And then they say, that's a provincial problem. So then we go to the ministries, provincial ministries of health and say, gee, we need to focus intervention programs on these high-risk families. And they say, we don't have the resources. The federal government has the resources. So we have this inter-federal provincial clash, and then we have what we call the silo effect. One ministry trying to dump it off to the other ministry. Because they say, you know, the health says, that's really the Ministry of Children and Family Development's problem, making sure that those families don't abuse the kids. But I argue is once the kid is abused, it's a health problem. 
They say, no, it isn't. It's a ministry of children found. So I sit on a committee, I did, with uh, 12 deputies, ministers, from health, education, housing, employment, youth, all these things. And I'm the researcher, the supposedly the neutral researcher. I like to think I am. <clears throat> and what I say is, if you don't all get together and make sure that the high-risk families, who we've already identified, they're already identified. There's no rocket science. If you've got a single parent mother who lives in a socially assisted housing and is 16, 17, or 18 years old, lives alone, or is in an abusive relationship with multiple partners, you've got a high-risk family, not rocket science. And they don't have no access to they have no access to daycare and no access to preschool. And when they get into uh, when they're in grade one or preschool, their 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 uh, learning skills or reading skills and numeric skills are way below average. And then the question becomes why? Is it just poverty? Well, um, what we know from all our research is you can come from the most cryogenic high poverty area, but if you have a single protective factor like a strong powerful a mother, father, someone in there, you can make it through. When people ask me, my students say to me, you know, how did you end up as a professor? I would say, my mother made pasta five days a week from when I was a little kid. That was a protective factor. <laughs> Couldn't speak English, but boy, could she make pasta. <laughs> so you have a single protective factor. Single parent mother, in my case, uh, the fact that uh, you had access in, in the city I did to playing hockey from five years old. So those are protective factors. So I would say to these ministers, we know what to do. We know exactly what to do. In fact, we've gone a step further. We're on the verge of major breakthroughs, which we've included in the Krakow instrument. So the Krakow instrument has a thousand protective, uh, uh, predictor variables involving risk and protective, a thousand. And we're building on it every day. For example, we know that you cannot expose uh, uh, children, fetuses, I mean, little, whatever you want to call them. I won't take a moral position on this. Call them what you want. But if a mother binge drinks, the likelihood of fetal alcohol spectral disorder skyrockets. If the mother is engaged with serious hard drugs, that causes epigenetic effects. If the, child, if the, if the fetus is exposed, the mother is exposed to extensive uh, uh, toxicities like lead and mercury poison, which are extremely high, particularly where I grew up in Trail, the largest lead zinc smelter in the world. We used to play on the zinc piles. And we used to think we were eating great tomatoes. They were full of lead. So whenever they do blood tests when we were playing hockey, they'd say, my god, your, blood, your lead levels are so high. And I'd say, that's why I'm so violent in retrospect. But that's a joke. Uh, uh, but the, the point is that we know what the risk factors are. But if you don't start at pregnancy with a healthy mother, then what the Krakow instrument shows, and, we, and that's a study done by Lucier, the second part. We've actually tested that, I, that. We looked at the perinatal relationship to aggressive child at two and three, and the statistic is overwhelming. The more perinatal threats the child faced by ages two and three, their level of aggression is off the charts. And what we're showing in the second part of our cohort study, now that there's six, seven, and eight, Instead of coming down that 99% of the kids, 95% of the kids do, their aggressive behaviors stay high, and they stay high life course, I would argue. So the, the, the Krakow instrument is, we're updating it literally every day almost, it seems. Every time I, uh, I spend two, three hours a day just trying to keep up with the new risks. For example, low birth weight uh, is very important in fetal development, and in, in uh, but also we find that, uh, Excessive weight is a risk. The other thing we find, very, very importantly, zero to one, is a lot of these mothers have difficulty bonding with the baby. If you don't bond with the baby, this is the work of Perry, Dr. Perry, you can see fundamental differences in the baby's brain development. And the brain development has to do with a lot of the issues that, again, Judge Breakoff talked about, is the ability to control impulsivity but also cognitive abilities. We can show powerful links there. So where we're going now in, in, in our research, uh, comparative research in, in North America and in Scandinavia particularly, is developing distinctive pathway models for treatment intervention strategies. 
Again, I can't get into it today, but we've identified at least seven pathway models. And they are linked to uh, genetic factors like temperament. The, for those of you who had kids, like I had two sons, I cannot believe the differences in temperament. One's quiet and gentle, and the other, if I don't put them in sports, I've got problems. It's temperament. So we show high reactive temperament, children have a greater likelihood of life course aggression, and extremely low reactive children have problems with aggression, often because they have psychopathic traits. Those are the kids that seem easy going, but they have uh, low empathy. Kids that are hyper reactive, react with a lot of anger when they, when they get too many environmental cues. And then we have the classics that we've already talked about here, fetal, fetal alcohol spectral disorder. The new one that's coming out that I'm working with colleagues at Children's Hospital in the University of British Columbia uh, in the, with a pediatric psychiatrist is uh, 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 autistic spectral disorder. We find a considerable number of our youth have autistic spectral disorder. And it's misdiagnosed as a learning disorder. It's a, development. it's a particular developmental disorder. So we have our classic learning disorders, again, genetic, epigenetic. So those are the direct pathway models, we call them. And the ability to intervene and treat some of them are tremendous. The problem is diagnostics. We end up diagnosing too late on the developmental trajectory. So when we come to saying, as I have, for example, the Lucier et al. project, of which I'm the co-principal investigator, that was funded through a ministry of healthy children. So they actually, in British Columbia, we have some progressive politicians who turned around and say, we understand the importance of early intervention. And it is critical because, for example, on the autistic spectral disorder, we've had enormous success with taking two-year-olds and three-year-olds in exposing to facial recognition programs. And they work. You can actually teach facial recognition. Now, again, depends where you're on the spectral disorder. I'm not, at the severe end, of course you can. But at the mild or moderate end, or the Asperger side of it, which is being removed in the DSM-5, nonetheless, you can make tremendous progress. With fetal alcohol spectral disorder, people are throwing up their hands saying it's hopeless. It's not hopeless. There's significant evidence, it gets preliminary, I admit, but if you provide structure assistance to FAST, again, not on the extreme side of the spectrum. If, for example, assisted living, assisted jobs, uh, a rent support, medical support, they can lead fairly healthy, non-violent, non-criminal lifestyles. But it takes complete structure. So the question that I always get from my senior ministers and, and uh, and, and, and political ministers is the cost, Ray, the cost. And the data is overwhelming and inclusive. There is a classic Perry Preschool project I think most of you have heard of. Started in the 1960s, and they're still evaluating for every dollar you spend on early intervention, you save the taxpayer 12. We showed the same in Vancouver, one of, one of our projects, intensive case management approaches where it's a wraparound, intensive, multidisciplinary team from all the ministries, they have the same ratio. One individual loan in Vancouver that we studied, one, cost the system, in his, by the time he was in his 30s, over a million and a half dollars, one person. So we can easily show that it's cost effective, no difficulty. Am I running out? So I'm going to leave some room for discussion because, again, there's enormous amount of information that I've thrown at you, and I look forward to some of the questions.